Well, as the government's grappled with Brexit and failed to find a majority for its plan, backbench MPs are taking matters into their own hands. Tomorrow, MPs could seize control of the Brexit process from the government. And one of the most influential is the chair of the Brexit Select Committee, Hilary Benn, who joins us now. Thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Big week ahead. Morning. I just want to start off with some of the speculation in the Sunday newspapers that there could be a coup being mounted against the Prime Minister. I mean, how do you feel about the prospect of a new Conservative Party leader, a new Prime Minister? I think we're probably seeing the uh, final stages of the current Prime Minister's leadership. But frankly, what matters more is the crisis that is still facing the country. This is a political crisis, a constitutional crisis, economic crisis. And as a result of the decision of the European Council last week, we've gained an extra two weeks, no more. So the real risk of a no-deal Brexit has merely been delayed. It has not been averted. So we need to take things in order. The first priority is to ensure that there is not a no-deal Brexit. The Chancellor couldn't have been clearer in his interview with you earlier when he talked about it being catastrophic for the British economy. On that, I agree with him completely. And the second thing we have to do is for Parliament, and that's the purpose of the amendment that a cross-party group of MPs have put down for Monday, is to see whether there is an alternative approach which can command support. But I've also come to the conclusion that, thirdly, whatever deal Parliament is prepared to put forward should go back to the British people, um, given the crisis that we're in. At the same time, though, that might make it more difficult for other parliamentarians to support whatever it is you're calling for, because for many people, the thought of a second referendum is something that fills them with dread because it means what they would see as overturning the result of the first one. Well, I've reflected long and hard on this, and I've been very struck in the last few weeks. The Prime Minister brought a deal to Parliament, it was rejected. She brought it back and it was rejected. She may bring it back this week, and I suspect it will be rejected again. Now, we're told that that is democratic, in an attempt to try and get us as MPs to change our mind, can someone please explain to me why it is undemocratic to ask the British people whether, on reflection, they would like to change their mind or not? The point about a confirmatory referendum and the amendment that uh, Peter Carlin and Phil Wilson have put together is, I think, the way forward. Jeremy spoke very approvingly of it when he was on your programme, I think, last week. It says, look, we've prepared whatever deal Parliament can agree with the European Union, Put that to the people. If that's carried, then we leave on that basis. So if people want to vote leave again, of course they can do so. We now know a bit more about what Brexit means. We don't yet know the full story. But if that is rejected, then the alternative would be that we would be remain in the European Union. And I, if Parliament remains deadlocked, and there's no guarantee that the indicative vote process that the Select Committee I chair called for, and which I hope will take place next week, no guarantee it will resolve the deadlock in Parliament. And in those circumstances, what other way is there of getting a final decision other than to go back to the British people? So Board? would you vote for the Prime Minister's deal as it stands if it was then put to a public vote? Caroline, well, I think she would. I think the proposal is, in effect, Parliament would allow it to go through. What does but that only mean? Parliament would vote for it? Well, people could abstain, but the fact is it would be approved, but only if the Prime Minister and the government gave an absolutely categorical commitment that it would then be put to the British people. Because you could only put in a referendum, a second referendum, a leave proposition that has been negotiated with the European Union, and that's the only one that there is at the moment. We may negotiate a different one, Norway in a customs union, for example, which there may be a lot of support for. But in the end, I think you need people's consent because we're now nearly three years on. And the truth about the last, well, two and three quarter years is that the fantasies that were presented by the Leave campaigners during the referendum, and you, you've heard them on the programme this morning, have collided with the reality. And it's a national crisis because the government has failed to face up to the real choices rather than carrying on pretending we can have our cake and eat it, because we can't, and now we know that. Now, you, more than perhaps anyone, are very, very plugged in to what's happening with these votes next week. You've been talking to members of the government about it as well. Can you just explain what you 
what you believe the strategy will be next week, how it will unfold, will there be a free vote, will the government be effectively allowing the amendment through, what, what's happening? Well, it's not entirely clear what the government's approach is going to take, and I listened very carefully to what Philip Hammond had to say, because the government could have taken control of this process, but we are acting as backbenchers because the government has failed to do that. It's in complete and utter chaos. We can all see that. Um, I think the, the key alternative options are do you want a free trade agreement like Canada? Now, I will not vote for that because it doesn't solve the problem of the border in Northern Ireland. It doesn't give you the kind of friction-free trade which Adam Marshall's members need in order to carry on with their businesses. The second option is a customs union. I think that is an essential building block of solving the Northern Ireland border problem. The third is a Norway plus arrangement, customs union plus Norway. It seems to me that is essential if you're going to keep an open border, honour the Good Friday Agreement and ensure that British businesses continue to trade freely. And then those are policy choices about the future. And then separate from that is how does the final decision get made? And that's where a confirmatory referendum comes in and I should vote for that when it is presented to Parliament. I think we could look, I mean, it's very complicated, isn't it, talking about all these different sure. uh, way forwards, but I think we have got a graphic where these are what Sky News are expecting, Indeed. effectively, some of the things to be. Uh, Philip Hammond basically ruled out the top one, no deal Brexit, and he ruled out the bottom one, revoke in Article 50, but he didn't rule out any of the others. I mean, is that effectively where you are? I mean, I guess the top three you probably wouldn't vote for, but are you willing to stomach the others? Well. A no-deal Brexit has been rejected by Parliament twice now, and that's absolutely clear. And there's another amendment down for Monday from my colleague Yvette Cooper, which is looking ahead, because we must ensure, going back to my first point, that we do not leave without a deal. A free trade agreement doesn't work. Indeed, the Prime Minister made that clear. She said a Canada deal wouldn't work for the Northern Ireland problem. The PM's deal's been rejected twice now. Um, I think... Whether you can describe a customs union plus the PM's deal, a customs union would be different. We've been asking the Prime Minister to accept the basic building block of making progress as a customs union, and she has resolutely refused to do that. I think a customs union and single market or variation thereof, I support a confirmatory referendum. The revocation of Article 50, I think the only circumstances, and it comes right back to the first point on your list, if we got to what, three weeks' time, and the EU said, I'm sorry, we're not prepared to give you an extension. Now, I'm absolutely clear the number one priority is to avoid a no-deal Brexit. If they refuse to give us an extension, then Parliament would be faced with the choice about whether to, to use that particular method. But we've got to do our job, and it's the government's failure to do its job is why Parliament... People say, grab control of the order paper. This is MPs doing their job, as the public would expect us to do, to try and find an alternative way forward. Well, let's talk about that, about MPs effectively doing its job, as you would say, yeah. taking control of the order paper, as others would. Um, I was in Brussels this week and I spoke yeah. to Philippe Lambert, who is an MEP on the Brexit steering group, and I can have a quick look at what he told me the delay was all about. He said, what we did here is to create some space to let Parliament take hold of the process. He described it as to give another chance to the adults in Westminster. I mean, is that what's happening? Is this effectively a parliamentary coup? It's not a coup because, in the end, Parliament has to agree a deal and a way forward. That's what we're elected to do. That's what the public expect us to do. Now, I very much welcome the fact that the EU agreed to provide some more time because a no-deal Brexit would be catastrophic for us, for the Republic of Ireland. It'd be very damaging for the European Union. I don't think they want to see that happen, but they are as frustrated as everybody else at the government's fracturing, what's... its inability... Uh, to move. And the really central question for next week, Sophie, is this. Supposing Parliament did say we're in favour of a different approach, all the indications are, from the last two and three quarter years, is that the Prime Minister has refused to shift an inch. She keeps saying, well, let's talk about my that. deal or no deal, my deal or no deal. Because we haven't got much time left. Fine. Um, David Liddington, a man that you've spent a lot of time with in meetings uh, in recent months, the de facto Deputy Prime Minister, a man who some people are saying should be put in place as a caretaker Prime Minister. Would you welcome that? Look, the leadership of the Conservative Party is a problem for the Conservative Party. I would like to see a change. Well, it's a problem for I, Parliament as well. Well, I would like to see a change issue. of government. But what I think is essential now is whoever is the leader of the Conservative Party, if Parliament decides that it is prepared to support a way forward, and if Parliament decides that it then wants to put that to the British people in a confirmatory referendum, the, the nation needs leadership that is prepared to compromise. 
That's the crucial point. And the reason Theresa May is in such difficulty this morning is she had steadfastly refused to shift an inch. And it's no good saying, my door is open, come and talk to me, if her mind is closed. And I'm afraid that's what the last two and three quarter years have demonstrated. Plus, there's been an unwillingness to tell the British people the truth about the real choices we face. OK, we're out of time. Hilary Ben, thank, thank you, you very much.